epilogue chapter two part two of the mysteries of paris volume six by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain the princess amelie part two do you remember my father said fleur de marie unable to overcome a shudder of horror do you remember the terrible scene that preceded our departure from paris when your carriage was stopped yes answered rodolph in a tone of melancholy brave chourineur after having once more saved my life he died there before our eyes well my father at the moment when that unhappy man expired do you know whom i saw looking steadfastly at me ah that look that look it has haunted me ever since added fleur de marie with a shudder what look of whom do you speak cried rodolph of the ogress of the tepi franc answered fleur de marie that monster you saw her and where did you not see her in the tavern where the chourineur died she was amongst the women who surrounded us ah now said rodolph in a tone of despair i understand struck with horror as you were at the murder of the chourineur you must have imagined that you saw something prophetic in the sinister rencontre yes indeed father it was so at the sight of the ogress i felt a death-like shiver and it seemed that under her scowl my heart which until then had been light joyous bounding was instantly chilled to ice yes to meet that woman at the very instant when the chourineur died saying heaven is just it seemed to me as a rebuke from providence for my proud forgetfulness of the past which i was hereafter to expiate by humility and repentance but the past was forced on you and you are not responsible for that in the sight of god you were driven to it overcome my poor child once precipitated into the abyss in spite of yourself and unable to quit in spite of your remorse and despair through the atrocious recklessness of the society of which you were a victim you saw yourself forever chained to this den and it required that chance should throw you in my way to rescue you from such thraldom then too my child your father says you were the victim and not the accomplice of this infamy said clemence but yet my mother i have known this infamy replied fleur de marie in a tone of deepest grief nothing can destroy these fearful recollections they pursue me incessantly not as formerly in the midst of the peaceful inhabitants of the farm or the fallen women who were my companions in saint lazare but they pursue me even in this palace filled with the elite of germany they pursue me even to my father's arms even to the steps of his throne and fleur de marie burst into an agony of tears rodolph and clemence remained silent in presence of this fearful expression of unextinguishable remorse they wept too for they perceived that their consolations were vain since then continued fleur de marie drying her tears i say to myself every moment in the day with bitter shame i am honoured revered and the most eminent and venerated persons surround me with respect and attention in the eyes of the whole court the sister of an emperor has deigned to fasten my bandeau on my forehead and i have lived in the mire of the cite familiar with thieves and murderers forgive me dearest father but the more elevated my position the more deeply sensitive have i been to the deep degradation into which i had fallen and at every homage paid me i feel myself guilty of profanation and i think it sacrilege to receive such attentions knowing what i have been and then i say to myself if god should please that the past were all known with what deserved scorn would she be treated whom they now elevate so high what a just and fearful punishment but poor girl my wife and i know the past we are worthy of our rank and yet we cherish you because you feel for me the tenderness of a father and mother but remember all the good you have done since your residence here and the excellent and holy institution you have founded for orphans and poor forsaken girls then too the affection which the worthy abyss of st hermengeld evinces towards you ought not that to be attributed to your unfeigned piety whilst the praises of the abyss of st hermengeld refer only to my present conduct i accept it without scruple but when she cites my example to the noble young ladies who have taken vows in the abbey i feel as if i were the accomplice of an infamous falsehood after a long silence rodolph resumed with deep melancholy i see it is unavailing to persuade you 
reasoning is impotent against a conviction the more steadfast as it is derived from a noble and generous feeling the contrast of your past and present position must be a perpetual punishment forgive me for saying so my beloved one forgive you and for what my dear father for not having foreseen your excessive susceptibility which from the delicacy of your heart i should have anticipated and yet what could i have done it was my duty solemnly to recognize you as my daughter yet i was wrong wrong to be too proud of you i should have concealed my treasure and lived in retirement with clemence and you instead of raising you high so high that the past would disappear as i hoped from your eyes several knocks were heard at this moment which interrupted the conversation rodolph opened the door and saw murphy who said i beg your royal highness's pardon for thus disturbing you but a courier from the prince of herkusen oldenzaal has just arrived with this letter which he says is very important and must be delivered immediately to your royal highness thanks good murphy do not go away said rodolph with a sigh i shall want you presently and the prince closing the door remained a moment in the ante-room to read the letter which murphy had brought him and which was as follows my lord trusting that the bonds of relationship existing between us as well as the friendship with which you have ever honoured me will excuse the boldness of the step i am about to take i will at once enter upon the purport of my letter dictated as it is by a conscientious desire to act as becomes the man your highness deigns to style his friend fifteen months have now elapsed since you returned from france bringing with you your long-lost daughter whom you so happily discovered living with that mother from whom she had never been parted and whom you espoused when in extremis in order to legitimize the princess amelie thus ennobled of matchless beauty and as i learn from my sister the abbess of st hermangeld endowed with a character pure and elevated as the princely race from which she springs who would not envy your happiness in possessing such a treasure i will now candidly state the purport of my letter although i should certainly have been the bearer of the request it contains were it not that a severe indisposition detains me at oldenzaal during the time my son passed at gerolstein he had frequent opportunities of seeing the princess amelie whom he loves with a passionate but carefully concealed affection this fact i have considered it right to acquaint you with the more especially as after having received and entertained my son as affectionately as though he had been your own you added to your kindness by inviting him to return as quickly as his duties would allow to enjoy that sweet companionship so precious to his heart and it is probable that my apprising you of this circumstance may induce you to withdraw your intended hospitality to one who has presumed to aspire to the affections of your peerless child i am perfectly well aware that the daughter of whom you are so justly proud might aspire to the first alliance in europe but i also know that so tender and devoted a parent as yourself would not hesitate to bestow the hand of the princess amelie on my son if you believed by doing so her happiness would be secured it is not for me to dwell upon henry's merits you have been graciously pleased to bestow your approval on his conduct thus far and i venture to hope he will never give you cause to change the favourable opinion you have deigned to express concerning him of this be assured that whatever may be your determination we shall bow in respectful and implicit submission to it and that i shall never be otherwise than your royal highness's most humble and obedient servant gustave paul prince of herkusen oldenzaal after the perusal of this letter rodolph remained for some time sad and pensive then a gleam of hope darting across his mind he returned to his daughter whom clemence was most tenderly consoling my dear child said he as he entered you yourself observed that this day seemed destined to be one of important discoveries and solemn explanations but i did not then think your words would be so strikingly verified as they seem likely to be dear father what has happened fresh sources of uneasiness have arisen on whose account on yours my child i fear you have only revealed to us a portion of your griefs be kind enough to explain yourself said fleur de marie blushing then hearken to me my beloved child you have perhaps good cause to fancy yourself unhappy when at the commencement of our conversation you spoke of the hopes you still entertained i understood your meaning and my heart seemed broken by the blow with which i was menaced for i read but too clearly that you desired to quit me for ever and to bury yourself in the eternal seclusion of a cloister my child say have i not divined your intentions if you would consent 
murmured forth fleur de marie in a faint gasping voice would you then quit us exclaimed clemence the abbey of st hermingeld is in the immediate neighbourhood of gerolstein and i should frequently see yourself and my father remember my child that vows such as you would take are not to be recalled you are scarcely eighteen years of age and one day you may possibly oh think not i should ever regret my choice there is no rest or peace for me save in the solitude of a cloister there i may be happy if you and my second mother will but continue to me your affection the duties and consolations of a religious life said rodolph might certainly if not cure at least alleviate the anguish of your lacerated and desponding mind and although your resolution will cost me dear i cannot but approve of it rodolph cried the astonished clemence do i hear aright is it possible you allow me more fully to explain myself replied rodolph then addressing his daughter he said but before an irrevocable decision is pronounced it would be well to ascertain if nothing more suitable both to your inclinations and our own could be found for you than the life of a nun fleur de marie and clemence started at rodolph's words and manner while fixing an earnest gaze on his daughter the prince said abruptly what think you my child of your cousin prince henry the brightest blush spread over the fair face of fleur de marie who after a momentary hesitation threw herself weeping in her father's arms then you love him do you not my darling child cried rodolph tenderly pressing her hands fear not to confide the truth to your best friends alas replied fleur de marie you know not what it has cost me to conceal from you the state of my heart had you questioned me on the subject i would gladly have told you all but shame closed my lips and would still have done so but for your inquiry into the nature of my feelings and have you any suspicion that henry is aware of your love gracious heavens dearest father exclaimed fleur de marie shrinking back in terror i trust not do you believe he returns your affection oh no no i trust he does not he would suffer too deeply and what gave rise to the love you entertained for your cousin alas i know not it grew upon me almost unconsciously do you remember a portrait of a youth dressed as a page in the apartments of the abbess de st hermengeld i know it was the portrait of henry believing the picture to be of distant date i one day in your presence remarked upon the extreme beauty of the countenance when you jestingly replied that it was the likeness of an ancestor who in his youth had displayed an extraordinary share of sense courage and every estimable quality this strengthened my first impression and frequently after that day i used to delight in recalling to my mind the fine countenance and noble features of one i believed to have been long numbered with the dead by degrees these reveries began to form one of my greatest pleasures and many an hour have i passed gazing amid smiles and tears on one i foundly hoped i might be permitted to know and to love in another world for in this continued poor fleur de marie with a most touching expression i will know i am unworthy to aspire to the love of any one but you my kind indulgent parents i can now understand the nature of the reproof you once gave me for having misled you on the subject of the portrait conceive dearest father what was my confusion when i learnt from the superior that the portrait was a living subject that of her nephew my trouble was extreme and earnestly did i endeavour to erase from my heart all the fond associations connected with that picture in vain the pertinacity with which i strove to forget but riveted the impression i had received and unfortunately dear father you rendered the task of forgetting more difficult by continually eulogising the heart disposition and principles of prince henry you loved him then my child from merely seeing his likeness and hearing his praises without positively loving him i felt myself attracted towards him by an irresistible impulse for which i bitterly reproached myself my only consolation was the thought that no person knew my fatal secret for how could i presume to love how excuse my ingratitude in not contenting myself with the tenderness bestowed on me by you my father and you also dearest mother in the midst of all these conflicting feelings i met my cousin for the first time at a ball given by you to the archduchess sophia his resemblance to the portrait too well assured me it was he 
and your introducing prince henry to me as a near relative afforded me ample opportunities of discovering that his manners were as captivating as his mind was cultivated it is easy to conceive then that a mutual passion sprung up between you indeed he won upon my regard ere i was aware of the ground he had gained he spoke of you so admiringly yet so respectfully you had yourself praised him so highly not more than he deserved it is impossible to possess a more noble nature or a more generous and elevated character i beseech you dearest father to spare me the fresh trial of hearing him thus praised by you alas i am already wretched enough go on my child i have a reason in thus extolling your cousin i will explain hereafter proceed though aware of the danger of thus daily associating with my cousin i felt unable to withdraw myself from the pleasure his society afforded me nor spite of my implicit reliance on your indulgence dear father durst i disclose my fears to you i could then only redouble my efforts to conceal my unfortunate attachment and shall i confess there were moments when forgetting the past i gave myself up to all the dear delights of a friendship hitherto unknown to me but the departure of prince henry from your court tore the veil from my eyes and showed me how truly and ardently i loved him though not with a sister's love as i had made myself believe i had resolved to open my heart entirely to you on this subject continued fleur de marie whose strength seemed utterly exhausted by her long confession and then to ask you what remained for one so every way unfortunate but to seek the repose of a cloister then dearest daughter let me answer the question ere you have put it by saying there is a prospect as bright and smiling awaits your acceptance as that you propose is cheerless and gloomy what mean you now then listen to me it was impossible for an affection as great as mine to be blinded to the mutual affection subsisting between yourself and your cousin my penetration also quickly discovered that his passion for you amounted to idolatry that he had but one hope one desire on earth that of being loved by you at the time i played off that little joke respecting the portrait i had not the least expectation of henry's visiting gerolstein when however he did come i saw no reason for changing the manner in which i had always treated him and i therefore invited him to visit us on the same terms of friendly relationship he had hitherto done a very little time had elapsed ere clemence and myself saw plainly enough the cause of his frequent visits or the mutual delight you felt in each other's society then mine became a difficult task on the one hand i rejoiced as a father that one so every way worthy of you should have won your affection then on the other hand my poor dear child your past misfortunes forbade me to encourage the idea of uniting you to your cousin to whom i several times spoke in a manner very different to the tone i should have adopted had i contemplated bestowing on him your hand thus placed in a position so delicate i endeavoured to preserve a strict neutrality discouraging prince henry's attentions by every means in my power and yet manifesting towards himself the same paternal kindness with which i had always treated him and besides my poor girl after a life of so much unhappiness as yours i could not bring myself suddenly to tear away the innocent pleasure you appeared to feel in the company of your cousin it was something to see you even temporarily happy and cheerful and even now your acquaintance with prince henry may be the means of securing your future tranquillity dear father i understand you not prince paul henry's father has just sent me this letter while considering such an alliance as an honour too great to aspire to he solicits your hand for his son who he states is inspired with a passion for you dearest father cried fleur de marie concealing her face with her hands do you forget i forget nothing not even that to-morrow you enter a convent where besides being for ever lost to me you will pass the remainder of your days in tears and austerity if i must part with you let it be to give you to a husband who will love you almost as tenderly as your father married and to him father you cannot mean it indeed i do but on one condition that directly after your marriage has been celebrated here without pomp or parade you shall depart with your husband for some tranquil retreat in italy or switzerland where you may live unknown and merely pass for opulent persons of middle rank 
and my reason for attaching this proviso to my consent is because i feel assured that in the bosom of simple and unostentatious happiness you would by degrees forget the hateful past which is now only more painfully contrasted with the pomp and ceremony by which you are surrounded rodolph is right said clemence with henry for your companion and happy in each other's affection past sorrows will soon be forgotten and as i could not wholly part with you clemence and i would pay you a visit each year then when time shall have healed your wounded spirit my poor child and present felicity shall have effaced all recollections of the past you will return to dwell among us never more to part forget in the past and present happiness murmured fleur de marie even so my child replied rodolph scarcely able to restrain his emotion at seeing his daughter's scruples thus shaken can it be possible cried fleur de marie that such unspeakable felicity is reserved for me the wife of henry and one day to pass my life between him yourself and my second mother continued she more subdued by the ineffable delight such a picture created in her mind all all that happiness shall be yours my precious child exclaimed rodolph fondly embracing fleur de marie i will reply at once to henry's father that i consent to the marriage comfort yourself with the certainty that our separation will be but short the fresh duties you will take upon yourself in a wedded life will serve to drive away all past retrospections and painful reminiscences and should you yourself be a mother you will know and feel how readily a parent sacrifices her own regrets and griefs to promote happiness of her child a mother i a mother exclaimed fleur de marie with bitter despair awakening at that word from the sweet illusion in which her memory seemed temporarily lulled oh no i am unworthy to bear that sacred name i should expire of shame in the presence of my own child if indeed i could survive the horrible disclosures i must necessarily make to its father of my past life oh never never my child for pity's sake listen to me pale and beautiful amidst her deep distress fleur de marie arose with all the majesty of incurable sorrow and looking earnestly at rodolph she said we forget that ere prince henry made me his wife he should be acquainted with the past no no my daughter replied rodolph i had by no means forgotten what he both ought to know and shall learn of the melancholy tale think you not that i should die were i thus degraded in his eyes and he will also admit and feel added clemence that if i style you my daughter he may without fear or shame safely call you his wife nay dearest mother i love prince henry too truly to bestow on him a hand that has been polluted by the touch of the ruffians of the cite a short time after this painful scene the following announcement appeared in the official gazette of gerolstein the taking of the veil by the most high and mighty princess amelie of gerolstein took place yesterday in the abbey of st hermengeld in the presence of the reigning grand duke and all his court the vows of the novice were received by the right reverend and illustrious lord charles maximus archbishop of oppenheim monsignor annibal andre one of the princes of delphes and bishop of sueta in partibus infidelium and apostolic nuncio bestowed the salutation and papal benediction the sermon was preached by the most reverend seigneur pierre d'asfeld canon of the chapter of cologne and count of the holy roman empire veni creator optime end of epilogue chapter two read by celine major epilogue chapter three of the mysteries of paris volume six by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain the vows rodolph to clemence gerolstein twelfth january eighteen forty two your assurance that your father is better induces me to hope you will be enabled to return here with him shortly i dreaded that at rosenfeld situated in the midst of the woods he would be exposed to the piercing cold of our rigorous winters but unfortunately his fondness for hunting rendered all our advice useless i entreat you clemence as soon as your father can bear the motion of the carriage quit that country and this habitation only fit for those germans of an iron frame whose race has now disappeared the ceremony of our poor child's taking the vows is fixed for to-morrow the thirteenth of january the fatal day on which i drew my sword on my father 
alas i thought too soon i was forgiven the hope of passing my life with you and my child made me forget that it was she who had been punished up to the present time and that my punishment was to come and it is come when six months ago she disclosed the double torture she suffered her incurable shame for the past and her hopeless passion for henry these two sentiments became by a fatal logic the cause of her fixed resolve to take the veil you know that we could not conceal from her that had we been in her place we should have pursued the same noble and courageous course she has adopted how could we answer those humble words i love prince henry too much to give him a hand that has been touched by the bandits of the cite i have seen her this morning and though she seemed less pale than usual though she said she did not suffer yet her health gives me the most mortal alarm alas this morning when i saw beneath the veil those noble features i could not refrain from thinking how beautiful she looked the day of our marriage it seemed that our happiness was reflected on her face as i told you i saw her this morning she does not know that to-morrow the princess juliana resigns her abatical dignity and that she has been unanimously chosen to succeed her since the beginning of her novitiate there has been but one opinion of her piety her charity and the exactitude with which she fulfils all the rules of the order she even exaggerates their austerity she exercises in the convent that authority she exercised everywhere but of which she herself is ignorant she confessed to me this morning that she is not so absorbed by her religious duties as to forget the past i accuse myself dear father said she because i cannot help reflecting that had heaven pleased to spare me the degradation that has stained my life i might have lived happily with you and my husband spite of myself i reflect on this and on what passed in the cite in vain i beseech heaven to deliver me from these temptations to fill my heart with himself but he does not hear my prayers doubtless because my life has rendered me unworthy of communion with him but cried i clinging to this faint glimmer of hope it is not yet too late your novitiate is only over to-day you are yet free renounce this austere life dwell again with us and our tenderness shall soften your grief shaking her head sorrowfully she replied the cloister is indeed solitary for me accustomed as i have been to your tender care doubtless cruel recollections come over me but i am consoled by the knowledge that i am performing my duty i know that everywhere else i should be liable to be placed in that position in which i have already suffered so much your daughter shall do what she ought to do suffer what she ought to suffer without founding any great hopes on this interview i yet said to myself she can renounce the cloister but as she is determined i can but repeat her words god alone can offer me a refuge worthy of himself adieu dear clemence it consoles me to see you grieve with me for i can say our child without egotism in my sufferings often this thought lightens my sorrow for you are left to me and what is left to fleur de marie adieu again return soon r abbey of st hermengeld four o'clock in the morning reassure yourself clemence thank god the danger is over but the crisis was terrible last evening agitated by my thoughts i recollected the paleness and languor of my poor child and that she was obliged to pass almost all the night in the church in prayer i sent murphy and david to demand the princess juliana's permission to remain until the morrow in the mansion that henry occupied usually thus my child would have prompt assistance and i prompt intelligence in case that her strength failed under this rigorous i will not say cruel obligation to pass the whole of a cold winter's night in the church i wrote to fleur de marie that whilst i respected her religious exercises i besought her to watch in her cell and not in the church this was her reply my dear father i thank you for this fresh proof of your tenderness but be not alarmed i am sufficiently strong to perform my duty your daughter must be guilty of no weakness the rule orders it i must submit should it cause me some physical sufferings how joyfully shall i offer them to god adieu dear father i cannot say i pray for you because whenever i pray to heaven i cannot help remembering you in my prayers you have been to me on earth what god will be if i merit it in heaven bless your child who will be to-morrow the spouse of heaven sister amelie this letter in some measure reassured me 
however i had also a vigil to keep at nightfall i went to a pavilion i had built near my father's monument in expiation of this fatal night about one o'clock i heard murphy's voice he came from the convent in order to inform me that as i had feared my unhappy child spite of her resolution had not had sufficient strength to accomplish this barbarous custom at eight o'clock in the evening fleur de marie knelt and prayed until midnight but overpowered by her emotion and the intense cold she fainted two nuns instantly raised her and bore her to her cell david was instantly summoned and murphy came to me i hastened to the convent where the abbess assured me that my daughter's swoon from which she had recovered had been caused only by her weakness but that david feared that my presence might seriously affect her i feared they were preparing me for something more dreadful but the superior said i assure you monseigneur the princess is in no danger the restorative the doctor has given her has greatly recruited her strength david soon returned she was better but had insisted upon continuing her vigil consenting only to kneel upon a cushion she is in the church then cried i yes monseigneur but she will quit it in a quarter of an hour i entered the church and by the faint light of a lamp i saw her kneeling and praying fervently three o'clock struck two sisters seated in the stalls advanced and spoke to her she crossed herself rose and traversed the choir with a firm step and yet as she passed the lamp she seemed to me deathly pale i remain at the abbey until the ceremony be over i think now it is useless to send this letter incomplete i will forward it to-morrow with all the details of this sad day adieu dearest i am heart-broken pity r end of epilogue chapter three read by celine major the last chapter of the mysteries of paris volume six by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain the last chapter the thirteenth of january rodolphe to clemence the thirteenth of january now a doubly sinister anniversary dearest we have lost her for ever all is over and it all it is true then there is a horrid pleasure in relating a terrible grief yesterday i was complaining of the necessity that kept you from me to-day clemence i congratulate myself that you are not here you would have suffered too much this morning i was in a light slumber and was awakened by the sound of bells i started in a fright it seemed to me a funereal sound a knell in fact our daughter is dead dead to us and from to-day clemence you must begin to wear her mourning in your heart a heart always so maternally disposed towards her whether our child be buried beneath the marble of a tomb or the vault of the cloister what is the difference to us hardly eighteen years of age yet dead to the world at noon the profession took place with solemn pomp and i was present concealed behind the curtains of our pew i felt but even with greater intensity all the poignant emotion we underwent at her novitiate how strange she is adored and they believe universally that she was attracted to a religious life by an irresistible vocation and yet whilst they believe it was a happy event for her an overwhelming sadness weighed down the spectators there appeared in the very air as it were a doleful foreboding and it was founded if only half realized the profession terminated they led our child into the chapter room where the nomination of the new abbess was to take place and thanks to my sovereign privilege i went into this room to await fleur de marie's return to the choir she soon entered her emotion and weakness were so excessive that two of the sisters supported her i was alarmed less at her paleness and the great change in her features than at the peculiar expression of her smile which seemed to me imprinted with a kind of secret satisfaction clemence i say to you perhaps we may very soon require all our courage i feel within myself that our child is mortally smitten may heaven grant that i am deceived and may my presentiments arise only from the despairing sadness which this melancholy spectacle has inspired fleur de marie entered the chapter-room all the stalls were filled by the nuns 
she went modestly to place herself last on the left-hand side still leaning on the arm of one of the sisters for she yet appeared very weak the princess juliana was seated at the end of the apartment with the grand prioress on one side and another dignitary on the other holding in her hand the golden crozier the symbol of abbatial authority there was profound silence and then the lady abbess arose took the crozier in her hand and said in a voice of great emotion my dear daughters my great age compels me to confide to younger hands this emblem of my spiritual power and she pointed to the crozier i am authorized by a bull of our holy father i will therefore present to the benediction of monseigneur the archbishop of oppenheim and to the approbation of his royal highness the grand duke our sovereign whosoever of my dear daughter shall be pointed out by you to succeed me our grand prioress will inform you of the result of the election and she who has been chosen will receive my crozier and ring i did not take my eyes off my daughter standing up in her stall her two hands folded over her bosom her eyes cast down and half covered by her white veil and the long folds of her black gown she was pensive and motionless not supposing for a moment that she would herself be elected as this fact had been communicated by the abbess to no one but myself the grand prioress took a book and read each of our dear sisters having been according to the rule requested a week since to place her vote in the hands of our holy mother and keep her choice secret until this moment in the name of our holy mother i declare to you my dear dear sisters that one of you has by her exemplary piety merited the unanimous suffrages of the community and that she is our sister amelie the most noble and puissant princess of gerolstein at these words a murmur of pleased surprise and satisfaction went around the apartment the eyes of all the nuns were fixed on my daughter with an expression of tender sympathy and in spite of my painful forebodings i was myself deeply touched at this nomination which done isolatedly and secretly had yet presented such an affecting unanimity the abbess continued in a serious and loud voice my dear daughters if it be indeed sister amelie whom you think the most worthy and most deserving of you all if it be she whom you recognize as your spiritual superior let each of you reply to me in turn my dear daughters and each nun replied in a clear voice freely and voluntarily i have chosen and i do choose sister amelie for my holy mother and superior overcome by inexpressible emotion my poor child fell on her knees clasped her hands and remained so until each vote was declared then the abbess placing the crozier and the ring in the hands of the grand prioress advanced towards my daughter to take her hand and conduct her to the abbatial seat rise my dear daughter said the abbess come and assume the place that belongs to you your virtues and not your rank have obtained for you the position you have gained pardon my holy mother but i would speak to my sisters then first place yourself my dear child in your abbatial seat said the princess it is from thence your voice shall be heard that place holy mother never can be mine replied fleur de marie in a low and tremulous voice what mean you my dear daughter so high a dignity was not made for me holy mother but the wishes of all your sisters call you to it permit me holy mother to make here on my knees a solemn confession and my sisters will see and you also holy mother that the humblest condition is not humble enough for me this arises from your modesty my dear child said the superior with kindness believing that the unhappy girl was giving way to a feeling of over-delicacy but i divined the confession fleur de marie was about to make and greatly alarmed i exclaimed in a voice of entreaty my child i conjure thee it is impossible my dearest clemence to describe the look which fleur de marie gave me in an instant she understood all and saw how deeply i should share in the shame of this horrible revelation she comprehended that after such a confession they might accuse me of falsehood for i had always made it out that fleur de marie had never left her mother at this reflection the poor dear child thought she would be guilty of the blackest ingratitude towards me she had not power to continue 
but bowed down her head overcome overwhelmed again i assure you my dear child said the abbess your modesty deceives you the unanimity of the choice of your sisters proves how worthy you are to replace me it is not the princess it is sister amelie who is elected for us your life began on the day when you first put foot in this house of the lord and it is this exemplary and holy life that we recompense i will say more my dear daughter if before you entered this retreat your life had been as wrong as it has been on the contrary pure and praiseworthy the heavenly virtues of which you have given me an example since your abode here would expiate and ransom in the eyes of the lord any past life however culpable and now my dear daughter judge if your modesty ought not to be reassured these words of the abbess were as you may think my clemence the more precious for fleur de marie as she believed the past ineffaceable unfortunately this scene had deeply moved her and although she affected calmness and serenity i saw that her features altered in a most distressing manner i believe i have convinced you my dear daughter said the princess juliana and you will not cause so great a grief to your sisters as to refuse this mark of their confidence and affection no holy mother she said with an expression which struck me and in a voice more and more feeble i think now i may accept but as i feel myself fatigued and in pain if you will permit it holy mother the ceremony of the consecration shall not take place for a few days as you wish my dear daughter but in the meanwhile until your dignity is blessed and consecrated take this ring come to your place and our dear sisters will do you homage according to our rules and the superior putting the pastoral ring on fleur de marie's finger led her to the abbatial seat it was a simple and touching sight supported on one side by the grand prioress bearing the golden crozier and on the other by the princess juliana each of the sisters as she passed by made obeisance to our child and respectfully kissed her hand but judge of my affright when she swooned before the procession of the sisters was terminated david had not quitted the convent and he hastened to the abbess's apartment whither we had conveyed her and then attended to her the superior having returned to close the sitting of the chapter i remained alone with my daughter after looking at me for some time she said my dear father can you forget my ingratitude can you forget that at the moment when i was about to make my painful confession when you implored me silence i beseech you and i did not reflect she continued with bitterness that in telling in the face of all the world from what an abyss of depravity you had rescued me i revealed a secret which you had preserved out of tenderness to me it would have been to accuse you publicly you my father of a dissimulation which you only resigned yourself to assure me a brilliant and honoured existence can you ever forgive me instead of replying i pressed my lips on her forehead she felt my tears flow having kissed my hands many times she said now i feel better and as i now am dead to the world i should like to make a few bequests in favour of several persons but as all i have comes from you do you authorise me dearest father say dearest and i will do all you desire i should wish my beloved mother to keep always in the little boudoir in which she usually sits my embroidery frame with the work i began it shall be so love your apartment is as when you left it clemence will be deeply touched by your thought of her as for you dear father take i pray my large ebony armchair in which i have thought of reflected upon so much i will put it beside my own in my own private closet and will imagine i see you in it every day where you have so often sat i said unable to repress my tears and now i would leave some souvenirs to those who took so much interest in me when i was unhappy to madame georges i would give the writing-desk i have lately used she taught me to write originally so the gift will be very appropriate she said with her sweet smile as to the venerable cure of bouqueval who instructed me in the religion i intend for him the beautiful crucifix in my oratory very well my dearest child i should like to send my bandeau of pearls to my good little rigolette 
it is a simple ornament which she may wear in her beautiful black hair and as you know where martial and la louve are in algeria i should like to send to the brave woman who saved my life my gold enamelled cross these different keepsakes dearest father i would have sent to them from fleur de marie i will do all you wish i will not forget one i am sure you will not dearest father is there no other person present to your memory the dear child understood me and pressed my hand whilst a slight blush tinged her pale cheeks as i said he is better out of danger and his father better as his son is better and what will you give to henry a souvenir from you will be a consolation so dear and precious my father offer him my prie dieu alas i have often watered it with my tears when begging from heaven for strength to forget henry as i was unworthy of his love how happy it will make him to see that you have had one thought of him as to the asylum for the orphans and young girls abandoned by their parents i should wish my dear father that here rodolph's letter was broken off by these words almost illegible clemence murphy will conclude this letter i am lost bereft of sense ah the thirteenth of january at the end of this letter murphy had written as follows madame by the order of his royal highness i complete this sorrowful recital the two letters of monseigneur will have prepared your royal highness for the overwhelming news i have to communicate three hours since whilst monseigneur was writing to your royal highness i was waiting in the antechamber for a letter to be dispatched by a courier when suddenly i saw the princess juliana enter in the greatest consternation where is his royal highness she said to me in an agitated voice writing to the grand duchess i replied sir walter she said you must inform monseigneur of a terrible event you are his friend you should tell him from you the blow may be less terrible i understood all and thought it most prudent to charge myself with the distressing intelligence the superior having added that the princess amelie was sinking gradually and that monseigneur must hasten to receive his daughter's last sigh i went into the duke's room who saw how pale i was you have some bad news for me terrible monseigneur but courage courage ah my forebodings he exclaimed and without adding a word he ran to the cloisters i followed him from the apartment of the superior the princess amelie had been conveyed to her cell after her last interview with monseigneur one of the sisters watched over her and at the end of an hour she perceived that the princess amelie's voice who spoke to her at intervals was weaker and more and more oppressed the sister hastened to inform the superior who sent for dr david who administered a cordial but it was useless the pulse was scarcely perceptible he saw with despair that the reiterated emotions having probably exhausted the little strength of the princess amelie there was not a hope of saving her left monseigneur arrived at this moment the princess amelie had just received the last sacrament a slight degree of consciousness remained in one hand crossed over her chest she held the remains of her little rose tree monseigneur fell on his knees at the foot of the bed and sobbed my child my beloved child in a voice of piercing agony the princess amelie heard him turned her head a little towards him opened her eyes tried to smile and said in a faint voice my dearest father pardon henry too and my beloved mother pardon these were her last words after a slight struggle of one hour she rendered her soul to god when his daughter had breathed her last sigh monseigneur did not say a word his calmness and silence were frightful he closed the eyelids of the princess kissed her forehead several times took piously from her hands the relics of the little rose tree and left the cell i followed him and he returned to the house outside the cloister when showing me the letter he had commenced writing to your royal highness and to which he in vain endeavoured to add a few words for his hand trembled too convulsively he said to me i cannot write i am crushed my senses are gone write to the grand duchess that i have no longer a daughter i have executed the orders of monseigneur 
may i be allowed as his old servant to entreat your royal highness to hasten your return as soon as the health of m d'orbigny will permit nothing but the presence of your royal highness can calm monseigneur's despair he will watch his daughter's remains every night until the day when she is to be buried in the grand ducal chapel i have accomplished my sad task madame deign to excuse the incoherence of this letter and to receive the expression of respectful devotion which i have the honour to be your royal highness's most obedient servant walter murphy on the evening before the funeral of the princess amelie clemence arrived at gerolstein with her father rodolphe was not alone on the day of fleur de marie's interment end of the epilogue end of the mysteries of paris volume six by eugene sue recorded by celine major